everybody. Welcome back to Connect the Dots with yours truly, Steve Casto. And uh, we're going to do a question and answer thing today. And uh, so I want you guys, as soon as you uh, can, just uh, if you want to, pipe in your questions. Let me hear what you got to say. Get the, you know, what, what your questions may be concerning any of the subject matter that we've done so far. Uh, also, if you just have uh, some general questions on just Christianity in general, is the Bible true? Uh, you know, can you trust it? Uh, is it historically based? Is it, you know, all these different things that people a lot of times have a problem with. Those are the things that we're really digging into here and connect the dots. Um, and, uh, you know, if, so as soon as you guys go ahead and start uh, digging in, you know, that'd be awesome. And, uh, hey, Pam, good to see you there. Um, so let's see. I got some feedback going on. And there we go. That's turned down. So uh, anyways, good, guy, good to see you guys. Um, so in the meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and get started on something completely different uh, and, and not Jason's Buddha belly. Uh, we're not going to skip to that today. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, jump in on uh, the next sec, just briefly on the next section. It doesn't really take too long uh, to cut through. And then we'll begin doing a question and answer because uh, we can really go deep on a lot of this stuff. And uh, I don't want to end up leaving everybody in the dirt on some on these things. So anyways, without further ado, without God... How do you find your meaning in life? And is meaning or destiny or purpose even required? Um, and so without God, let's take a look at what uh, an American paleontologist named uh, Stephen Jay Gould has to say. He's an evolutionary biologist, science historian from Harvard. And this is uh, excerpted from his book called I Have Landed. And it says... The human species has inhabited this planet for only 250,000 years or so, roughly 0.0015% of the history of life, basically the last inch of the cosmic mile. The world fared perfectly well without us for all but the last moment of earthly time, and this fact makes our appearance look more like an accidental afterthought than the culmination of a prefigured plan. Moreover, the pathways that have led to our evolution are quirky, improbable, unrepeatable, and utterly unpredictable. Human evolution is not random. It makes sense and can be explained after the fact. But wind back life's tape to the dawn of time and let's play it again. And you will never get humans a second time. We are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because the earth never entirely froze, enti never froze entirely during an ice age, because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook, may we, we may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. This, this explanation, though superficially troubling, if not terrifying, is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively in the facts of nature. We must construct these answers ourselves from our own wisdom and ethical sense. There is no other way. So without God and according to evolution and science, uh, your life's meaning in a godless universe is just to exist. You're the God of your own life, responsible for determining your own value and discovering your own meaning. Once again, you're left on your own, just a meaningless speck on the dark side of, in uh, you know, the third rock from the sun and an armpit of a spiral galaxy on the far end of the universe. That's all you are. Enjoy. So anyway, that's, you know, awfully sarcastic, but I mean, there's a lot of questions about that that people just genuinely have. In fact, I was just reading uh, just before we got online from uh, Quora.com. And, you know, that's a hodgepodge of all sorts of different things. But you know, this one lady asked, she goes, if there is no God, then what is the meaning of life? And, sprawling through, and scrolling through the comments, 
is, uh, you know, pretty uh, not eye opening, depressing, I guess you could say, because life without God is meaning. I mean, once you know God, it's it's it, it's really you can't look past him. And so um, what we're left with without him is, I don't know, disturbing, terrifying, like uh, like Stephen Gould said. Um, and then this one lady, other lady in that same thread, she goes, why is it such a problem if life doesn't have a higher purpose or meaning? Frankly, I would rather live in a universe where crap happens than one where there is some all-powerful deity expecting really allowing really terrible things to happen but still expecting to get worshipped all the same perhaps the real problem is just our selfish need to feel important we want to think that what we choose to do or don't do actually matters you know so here we are living life in a bubble with no purpose there is no hope for an afterlife there is you know, the one guy in another thread further down said basically something to the effect of, hey, remember that time from before you were born? Well, death is exactly the same way. And it's the same way as when you're sitting in the dentist chair. You get knocked out to have a teeth, your te one of your teeth pulled. And then, you know, you wake up, you know, your, you know, dental surgery has been done, but, you know, you don't remember anything. You know, well, that's that's death. You know, that's the same thing is what the, is what these people are saying. So realistically, you have 70 years to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and try to make things work. And it's according to how you feel and it's according to how you want to put things together and how you want to meld with society. I mean, I look back at some of the things that are reviewed uh, from that um, talk that I did about from the, uh, the parable of a madman with Nietzsche where he talks about, you know, this conversation is for future generations to fill in the gaps where God once existed, but we've killed him. And so we're here. Welcome to a baseless, foundationless, insecure, mushy existence without God. And we wonder why we can't get along because... We're all trying, people without God are all trying to get their feet underneath them in order to provide a solid foundation on which to build their lives. Now, not only do we get a solid foundation with Christ to build on that gives us kind of a leg up, it helps us to understand that when the, uh, the terrors of life come knocking on our door and bad things happen to good people, we're able to have the strength which comes from Christ to be able to lift us up. Most of the world doesn't have this. To be able to smile in the face of adversity, even though we're feeling like crap ourselves, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's something that without meaning and without a solid sense of where you come from, that's really, distur that, that, that's, that's really comforting. You know, we, we got to have we got to have that foundation. If we don't have that foundation, then we're lost just like everybody else. If we don't <clears throat> rely on God and really lean into him when things get going rough, yeah, then then we're going to end up no better off. We end up, you know, bouncing down the bowling lane, you know, with the if, you know, you put in the bumpers, you know, bouncing down the bowling lane, trying to get a strike. And you know what? That rarely if ever happens, you know, so. We all have to basically make sure that 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 we're staying that we stay attentive to what God is having us do, what he's you know, what he, how he's guiding us, how he's leading us. And that gives us the strength to be able to bear up under. So I'm going to take a look here and see what uh, if anybody has any questions on anything yet. Um, Stetson Elam says, the basis of my faith is built around the fact that I refuse to believe we're a pointless accident. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. We are here for a reason. And uh, yeah, Jess, you're absolutely right. Life without God is void. We have a relationship with him that we didn't know that we were missing out on when we didn't have him in our life. And, and that's the whole point. When we talk to, you know, the, the whole reason for getting into this whole topic of, you know, Talking about God without relying on 
chapter and verse is, I think, super important because, um, well, for one, today's world really doesn't give the Bible any sense of authority. It's looked on as a book of fairy tales, just like Grimm's fairy tales or any novel that you would pick up at Disney. You know, that that's pretty much what the Bible is these days. And, you know, I can't wait to get into, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just sidetrack for a second. I was uh, looking at uh, uh, Cold Case Christianity. I can't remember what the guy's name is that does that, but the guy's a, a cold case investigator. And uh, he goes back and digs into cases that are on average 20 to 30 years old and uh, tries to find enough evidence to prosecute. And so he goes through a whole bunch of uh, kind of legal mumbo jumbo. But he goes through what he uh, said, basically, as an atheist, he was trying to jump into the Bible to prove its errancy to prove that there would if you were to take it into court that you would not be able to prove a thing but if nothing else he proved the fact that the uh there are the, that the book of luke and acts were written before the temple was destroyed in ad 70 which was 40 years removed from christ's death approximately and then even before that Luke quotes Mark, and uh, so does Paul. And so you have even a prior example to, let's say, AD, uh, uh, you know, before AD 70 or AD 60. I can't remember what exactly what the dates was that he used, but man, he was talking about within five to 10 years after Christ ascended, you can prove, you know, uh, there's evidence that proves that, that, that Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. You have historians outside the Bible that talk about this. There are, I'm also reading another book called Irresistible by Andy Stanley, the son of uh, Charles Stanley. And uh, he talks about how the first century church was irresistible. Most anthrop and this one lady who's, an, who's a secularist was basically saying that there is no reason that Christianity should have ever taken off. But yet crowds followed Jesus. People followed him from all over. Christ didn't come down on them in as much as he came down with scripture on uh, uh, the, the, the spiritual authorities uh, at the time. One of the things that they were, he was saying is that, uh, is that the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who rarely ever got together other than to bicker and argue over some little tiny part of the law they got together because jesus was threatening he was gaining too much popularity even rome was was nervous of this christ because he was setting himself up calling himself king of the jews and uh, all these people anyway they were scared of yet another insurrection uh coming out of judea uh as it as about what was it i think it was there was like two or three at least insurrections before Jesus's time that they had to go in and with the army put it down. And so we have um, all these different evidences that point to the validity of God, the validity of the scriptures, the validity of Jesus and his resurrection. And we'll get into all those in a bunch of great, a lot of great detail. But, you know, just going down this one thing, just looking at this Quora and taking a look at some of the comments in here. You know, what is, what is one of the things that turns this, this one person off of God? Uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they don't like God because he's some all-powerful deity allowing really terrible things to happen and then expecting to get worshipped all the same. I mean, there are so many assumptions that, that come in people's idea of God that it really steers people away. And then... Looking back at church history, it's no wonder that because that once science and the age of reason and the age of uh, enlightenment came about, that started to really shed some light on the the off-based superstitions and traditions and ideas that the uh, the church had. Now, 
under Constantine, Constantine was the Roman emperor that basically established Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. And in order to keep the peace, he had to include different rites and aspects of pagan religions uh, at the time and ordered for people who believed differently to not revolt. And so that is mistake number one. Um, there, well, actually in a series of mistakes, even Paul, hundred, you know, a couple hundred years prior to that was talking about uh, false teaching coming in and uh, the, polluting the gospel in, the, in, in Ephesians and Galatians. He talks about uh, people cutting in, you know, people cutting in on people's simple faith. Now, what is it about Christ and this simple faith? that we have that <clears throat> makes people shy away from the idea of religion, from the idea of God, from the idea of there being a creator in the world. What was it about the New Testament church and its amazing capacity to, what was it? It, it was in, in Acts, so it said 3,000 were added to their number on that day. I think it was day of Pentecost or shortly thereafter or whatever. But um, what is it about, about the, uh, about the early church that was so weird that, you know, that is just so compelling. What is it about our faith? What is it about our Christianity? That is not, what is it about the church today? That is not. Why do people, when you bring up God, shrink back and and revile the fact that you're religious what happened how did we get here what have we become to the world that people don't look to us for hope that they don't look to us for a new sense of the good news for a foundation for a sense of meaning why is it that we that we sit and we have to fight for our, 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 our relevance in today's world. If, if we don't fight for our relevance today, we're just going to be sloughed off into the corner, thrown into a prison or into a labor camp and just forced to eke out the rest of our life on gruel as we do hard labor for the rest of everybody else. Or worse yet, you know, get stoned, get burned alive or whatever. I see a sense in church history that when the church gets comfortable, overly confident, cocky, and power hungry, we lose our relevance. There's something that is, that is to be said, we need to work. We need tribulation in order to thrive. We need trial in order to show the dramatic difference between quote unquote, I don't like putting it like this, but us and them. I don't like drawing the lines because, because we're all human beings. We all are supposed to love each other. And I don't want to have an us versus them. It's an, it's an us wishing that them or they would join us. I want the next, my fellow man to be as fulfilled as I am. What is it that we're not doing to have people see that fulfillment? Is it a difference in behavior, a difference in mindset? My friend, uh, I've got a, a close friend who uh, um, was telling me about a lot of the people that he associates with um, down at a homeless shelter Frequently, they'll ask him, what in the world, how in the world can you smile and keep on going through all this craziness? And, uh, you know, so therein is a difference. You know, he, he, the, there's an old saying that says, you know, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And um, it's... Uh, it's super important to remember that our words are important as well. The things that we do, the things that we say, 
are are watched and listened to frequently. Um, but yet that's not enough. I don't know. It, it's just something that I'm kind of just uh, running back and forth in my brain uh, with a lot of the things that I've been seeing. Because, I mean, as I've been doing the studies for all of this uh, philosophy and science and all that stuff, one of my favorite things to do is to um, uh, go through the comments section and see what people have to say or what their rebuttals might be for their um, – uh, for, for the speaker. Um, and I'll tell you what, it's super hard to see how disillusioned people are with spiritual, the spiritualism and faith. It's just an absolute hatred. And I get it to a certain degree. People want to live or they don't want to be, they don't want to have to change. They don't want to have to be a certain way, but you know, it, it, it's way, you know, the spiritual life, the Christian life is way more than just obedience it's way more than just following a set of rules. There's such a profound passion in the Christian life that is indescribable. And it's hard to put those things into words. But let me jump over for a second to uh, some of these comments here because some people are starting to chime in. Mike Trichel. Jesus was upsetting, uh, setting their status quo. Uh, there is absolute love for one another. Um, many in the church today have become just as cynical as the world. In some cases, complacency is a is a poison. The fact <clears throat> the fact that it is not a cause to get behind. Absolutely, our comfortable church mirrors secular life. That's what uh, Nan had to say. And absolutely, uh, Jay said uh, that reminds me of something I thought the other day. My mind thought of all the non-believers and how empty they must feel without Christ. Then I thought of my life when I was not in fellowship and how empty I was. There was no other word to describe that feeling. It's just empty. Thanks be to God, I know how fulfilling he is, but yet my heart aches for those who don't know the Lord. Um, you know, people don't know what they don't know these days. And... Many times when confronted with spirituality, they're, they don't want to see it. They don't want to look because they're afraid of, of what they might find. And I'm sorry, folks, but in a lot of ways, that's the church's fault. We have, be, we have used the Bible as a battering ram more than we have a life jacket. And... Um, God's word should be a comfort. Now, granted, yes, I understand that there are times when then we that we need to use the, the you know the Lord's the God's word for correction, but you know, more often than not, that was what Jesus used against the religious leaders of his day. When someone doesn't recognize the word as authority, what do we have left in our back pocket to use to be able to help people understand that God is not just, what was this one guy that this uh, said something uh, um, down here about fairy, fairy, fairy in the sky, I think is what he called God. You want to believe it? That's all on you. Basically, he says, you know, whatever makes you, whatever makes you happy. Um, but you guys, the, uh, We're all in this journey together through life. We've, as Christians, have found meaning. We have found a reason for being, and we realize that we are here, you know, not just for our own fun and, and, and enjoyment, although God blesses us with that. Um, we're here for his pleasure as well and to please him. It gives us something to do. It gives us a reason to wake up every day and go, because, I mean, guys, you know, when we go through every day without any sense of, of having accomplished anything, yeah, so I went to work today and I finished scraping wallpaper off of a wall. Wow, that's fulfilling. My life has meaning. Sarcasm, if you can't tell. But, you know what, the big thing that I look forward to in serving God is this really amazing embrace at the end of the day when he says, man, you killed it today, dude. And, uh, and he just hugs you. 
And you get this immense feeling that from the God that, it, it, you know, is more powerful than you can imagine and bigger than you can imagine embracing you as you're getting ready to close your eyes and go to sleep. The well done, my good and faithful servant at the end of the day is worth more than a million paychecks of a million dollars. It is. And, and we get to enjoy that for all of eternity. How can we convey that to other people? What are our, what are, what are our answers going to be to their difficult questions? And here's the question that this lady asks on this, on this website. She goes, um, she goes, if there's no God, what is the meaning in life? She goes, I'm asking for uh, this one for my daughter. I'm asking this one for my daughter. She's been looking into her heart, trying to find answers. I hope this helps you in your quest, baby girl. Here's a mom trying to find meaning for her daughter. The impact of that is devastating if we don't have an answer. Because what are we going to tell her for the next generation? All these young parents out there that are trying to find answers that they don't even know for their kids. What do we tell them? Where do we find the impact? You know, the truth, you know, speaking the truth in love is one thing. In fact, that might be the most powerful thing, speaking the truth. But, you know, when people don't recognize the Bible as an authority, what is truth? <laughs> Well, there's a deep question. You know, people have been philosophizing on that since Plato and Aristotle. What is truth? You know, all the way up to today, you know, secularists haven't even found the answer to that one. You know, truth, the only thing that people call truth these days is something that you can observe and, or hypothesize, you know, observe, and then you know, use the scientific method on. Do an experiment and then repeat it. And then it can be verified as fact because it happens the same way. Your experiment comes out with the same results every time. And that's what people call truth. It's something that you can prove. But when you get into the metaphysical type stuff, like I talked last week about morality, um, you know, there's a real shaky leg to stand on because where does it come from? And um, you had a lot of philosophy, a lot of secular philosophers that I it touched on last week that were saying we don't even want to go there because this is something that you cannot observe. All that we can observe essentially is let me see um, where was this? Uh, I think it was was it Einstein? I don't even remember right now. No, that's on meaning of life. Where does morality, moral law? There it is, Kant. Uh, this is, um, here we go. Here we go. Uh, here's a quote from a, uh, website, uh, community university. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, it is cuny.edu, social sciences, Kantian theory and moral law. Uh, and basically the, one of the key statements that I pulled out of here, therefore to obey the moral law is nothing else than to obey the basic structure and drive of human reason that is in each and every person, and that is also the source of human freedom and autonomy. Why does man... Do so, okay, from all the stuff I've read, or a lot of the stuff that I've read, one of the main things that, that man is seeking is freedom, and what he is calling freedom is autonomy. Not have anybody dependent on him for an answer, not being dependent on anybody else for an answer, being self-sufficient and the center of your own universe, calling whatever shots that you see fit so that you can do whatever it is that you want without having the prick of conscience or anything. Be able to get away with murder if there was no other person around other than the victim that you're contemplating murdering. But um, the, the, so without God, we're just left spinning our wheels. Everything is dependent on us, our meaning, 
our morality, all these different things. Yeah, yeah, philosophers can't even understand the idea that why is moral law universal? I think this was also in this section here, something about the universality of the moral law, that even if there were like aliens and stuff out there, they would have to, um, oh, here it is. The nature of reason itself is universal. This is made most clear in logic, mathematics, and in science. I touched on this last week. We looked for universal law. We look for universal laws by which the universe is guided. My question is by whom? Let me continue. Well, so in practical affairs of human, oh, oh, then he then he concludes. Well, so in practical affairs of human moral existence, and so. Who sets the who sets the standard? Why? It, how did moral law? I mean, is moral law now being reduced to a a a, a an idea such as gravity, or uh, you know, behaviors of light? Is it uh, does it have substance or is it energy? You know, there there are all these uh, different uh, ideas going around that that people don't understand even some of the most basic things of our universe, and yet we're trying to look into the, you know, something that you can observe like light nobody understands or doesn't have a deep understanding of it. But yeah, we're trying to jump into the metaphysical and try to gain definitions and solid definitions for morality and meaning. How can you do that? Why is it that we think so highly of ourselves that we are ready to say that we are the epitome of power and substance in the universe? What we say goes, the way we observe everything is the way it is. I mean, what was it? In 14, what? 1400s, the earth was flat. Christopher Columbus was, hey, good luck with that floating off the end of the world thing. Copernicus. At the, up to the point of time when uh, Copernicus, I think it was, at, uh, or Galileo, I can't remember, one of the two, you know, basically was showing that... Uh, Hey guys, no, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around or revolves around the sun. <clears throat> we didn't know what infrared and ultraviolet light was because we didn't have the instruments to measure it because we couldn't see it with our own eyes. How much more is there to discover? And yet we say that no God can exist. I mean, what was it? They, I just saw an article today about discovering some type of fifth, fifth type of matter. And then they're discovering other dimensions on a on a uh, on a quantum scale, and then uh, and then they discovered another type of thing in outer space. I can't remember exactly what some of these things were, but I mean there is so much discovery, and 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 yet we're not willing to give God the time of day because He doesn't fit within the scope of our reason, or we've disproved a couple things, or think we've disproved a couple things in the Bible, and therefore we throw out the baby with the bathwater because church spanked us when we were a kid. That's where we are today, guys. Spoiled rotten, wanting to just do our own thing and throwing a temper tantrum in front of our heavenly father because we just want to get away with murder and not be called on the carpet for it. It's easy to get angry about those kind of things, but it's the love of Christ that compels us to look into the heart of man and try to Speak the love of God to him. How do we do that? How do we affect a change in today's world? I'm going to jump back over here and take a look at uh, so if there's any questions or comments. Um, let's see. Nan says, we as Christians uh, should have found meaning that lights us up. That cannot be resisted. But in truth, many have not. For so many Christians, their relationship with Jesus is not intimate and full he's an idea an image a concept to talk about to share with others but not to be in full relationship with yeah yeah, yeah. uh let's see and i totally agree yeah there, i mean that that's a that's definitely an aspect man i i, I totally agree with that um and it, you know, here's the other side of that too, guys. You know, the Bible says that you know, don't be afraid when you go in front of uh, governors and kings and princes and those in authority, worrying about what to say, because in the right time, God will give you the word to say, and they'll be impactful. I mean, 
did, you know, everybody kind of remembers the, uh, the, the martyr Stephen, uh, who was, uh, who, who was on trial for his faith and basically spoke from his heart in front of the Sanhedrin, just a powerful message. And this young man, Saul was there watching the whole thing. And when they took his, he, he's the, Saul is the one that held their clothes. I don't remember why it was that they, that they had to hold the, that he was holding the clothes of the ones that were stoning the man, except for the fact that they didn't want to get blood on it. And so that's why he was standing there just watching and listening and observing. And I can't help but think that that's one of the things that kind of sunk into this young man's mind, Saul, who became Paul. The clear conviction that this that this martyr had. You know, if people wanted to disprove Christ's resurrection, why didn't they just drag the body through the streets behind a Roman horse? Why didn't the Sanhedrin do that? Why did they just leave it entombed? Why didn't anybody speak at what, you know, Saul knew the truth. There is this rumor going around that he, that he, that he resurrected or that somebody stole the body or something like that. Well, you know what? Here's another side of that. You guys, the Romans that were guarding that tomb were guarding it literally for their very lives. <clears throat> If they were derelict in their duties, they were killed for be, for dereliction of duty. And this was super important if they had to make sure that nobody broke in there, nobody could steal it because Pilate was more interested in keeping the peace than he was trying to quell a religious movement. Yet, you never hear from these Romans again, except for you know, maybe one or two of them may have been saved in the process at some point in time later on down the road. We don't really know. But there are so many things that point to the resurrection of Christ being such a super important thing. And Paul knew this. He knew the stories. He was around. And Stephen, he was there for his death. And then on the road to Jericho, when Christ confronted him on that pathway and said, why do you persecute me? <laughs> and he knew who he was talking to. He knew he was busted. And then he turned his life around, changed his name to Paul and became one of the most prolific writers of the New Testament. He went on to Rome to speak before Caesar. He went through the entire empire. He went through mo quite a bit of the, the empire, mostly, of course, around the... Uh, he went to Spain, I think, uh, uh, Greece, uh, present-day Turkey. Uh, he went all over. And then we have the other apostles or disciples, some of whom went to as far as Great Britain, India, Ethiopia, and just the entire known world heard the gospel from those who saw this resurrection firsthand. That's what that's one of the things that made an impact. And even in the face of death, they did not quail. They didn't say, no, I, you know, like Peter did. <laughs> like Peter. He they didn't say, No, I don't know him. I don't know. Save spare my life. Oh, okay. We'll let you go. No, they were like, you know, no, kill me now. That way I get to see him again. I mean, yeah, sure, it was painful. Yeah, sure, there was a lot of torture and all those things involved in that. But you know what? It was worth it. When do we let our when do we let our convictions fail us? When do we let our passion fail? For God be hidden. We're not out here to correct the world. We're here to bring hearts back to life. To bring resurrection. Because Paul says that when we accept Christ, we pass from death into life. The old is gone, the new has come. The life we live, we live now for Christ and we're a slave to him. It's that conviction 
that we have to have. My life isn't my own. I've been bought with a price and I will give everything in my power, even my own life for the sake of the gospel. Our Christianity in the West has not been tested that far to, to a certain degree. And it's getting close. I fear to say that that the right wing extremists will look the same as Al Qaeda someday and we will be considered as Christians white right wing extremists. It's entirely possible. As people don't want to hear. Like it says in Romans 120, no one is has any, no one has an excuse. And so when you're called on a carpet to answer. You don't want to have to answer. So people are trying to avoid the carpet as much as possible. And, and if it means putting Christians off to the side or getting rid of them. Yeah, that's uh, that's that'll that would be huge. So why not? You know, why, why? What has kept people from from doing that kind of a thing thus far? Well, for one thing, it's probably not the time yet. But you guys. We're in a time where our impact needs to be felt. The difference needs to be shown. The and I don't I, I mean I don't have all the answers here. So I'm gonna turn to the comments here real quick and see what uh, everyone else kind of has to say here. Um, Jesus is for many a historical figure, not a not a a, uh, a a live and present reality. Lack of passionate and intimate relationship. This has nothing. This has nothing to show to the world. But those who reflect the light of His glory and their faces shine with passion and love for a very loving and present Savior and Lord. These have much to speak in this world. Amen to that, Mike. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, that's yeah. And and Jess says science and history coincide with the Lord. That is fact, and it absolutely is. And I'll actually, Jess, I'll be getting into that a little bit more uh, after I go through uh, a lot of this philosophy section because a lot of the historical proofs and archaeological proofs will go into not just there being an existence of God. But why is it the God of Christianity that sets himself that 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 sets itself apart from all the other four thousand and two four thousand two hundred religions that are in the world and the literally millions of deities that are in the world? Um, let's see. Darren says, hey, what's up, Marnie? Let's see. What's up, Darren? Everybody's saying howdy to each other. Uh, let's see. As he, are, as he is, so are we in this world. Okay, gotcha. All right, I think I'm all caught up. So, all right, folks. Yeah, so um, so here we are in, so here we are in this world, and, and, and everybody's trying to get rid of, of God. And when, the more we preach of God, you know, yeah, we might be next to be gotten rid of and, or silenced or at least made to look like fools. And you know what? That's fine. But looking back at the life of Jesus in the first century church, why did crowds, if you look at the book of Mark, why in almost every chapter of Mark were crowds following Jesus? I uh, yeah, gotcha, I think, on that. All right. <laughs> I can't get that. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, thanks, Fish, got it. Um... So uh, when we get back, when, we, when we're looking back at the, why were crowds following Jesus through Mark? Almost every chapter says there were crowds. What was it that was so new and intriguing and enticing about the gospel that made just people flock to him? What was it about this first century church that made 3,000 people add, add to their number or, and, and hundreds or more, that were like thousands maybe daily at times? What is it that set them apart? And guys, that's that's kind of like our homework. This is kind of what we're, we're what we're going to be uh, looking to discover is 
right now we're discovering answers and we need to, you know, we need to have enough love and forbearance to look past the ignorance, look past the assumptions and the ridicule that will be thrown our way as we stand for truth. And I think the more we make state, you know, what I mean by stand is not necessarily on the preach corner, the street corner with a sign, repent for the end is near or turn or burn or anything along those lines. You know, you know, Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you. You know, those kind of things, you know, those are the statements that, um, that need to get, that need to get out there. You know, you know, what, what is it that, what is it that, what is it that, that you have for your faith? If you were asked any of these difficult questions, why do you believe in God? What is, what would your answer be? Is it because it is true that I believe or is it because of something else? Is it a feeling? Well, you know, when people have a near-death experience, they attribute that to, to I can't remember what the name of the chemical is that flashes through your brain just before you die or and are born and uh, whatever. But uh, DMT, I think, is what it is. Um, and uh, so people can, you know, just flush away feelings because it's not it's subjective, and it can be explained away with science. So we have all these questions that, that we need to be ready for and we need to have the right answers and not as gotcha proved you wrong, but as let me show you eternal life. Let me show you what this new kingdom is. Let me show you the reason that when you reach for your destiny, you find yourself getting lost and off track. Let me show you that you know, how, how when you have questions in this world and you're trying to form your own, you're trying to form your own uh, belief system or worldview, something that's solid, something that you can build on that's not going to get wishy-washy and go back and forth like the latest fads. You know, is it COVID season? Is it riot season? Or what do we believe about this? What do we believe about that? You know, are you going to follow the, the echo chamber that you ascribe to? Or are you going to seek out the solid truth that is sometimes right down the middle, maybe favors one side or another? And then how do you speak that? What do we need to do in order to make Christ? He, granted, a lot of this is up to him. But what do we need to do in order to allow Christ and God and the Holy Spirit to lead us so that the church and attending church and not the building, getting together and seeking out other believers and fellowshipping with them. Why isn't that something that everybody is flocking toward? And of course, you know, Christ also said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword and people will hate you because of me. Yes, I get that. And yes, hatred seems so prevalent these days, but at the same time, we bear up under it. We have the light. We have the truth. And we can, I've seen a couple articles actually right now where I think it was the same intersection roughly where Floyd, George Floyd, sorry, was, was uh, uh, lost his life, um, supposedly. And uh, right now there's, People getting baptized there. Christians have taken that. Like that seems like some Christians have somehow maybe taken that intersection over. And people are finding Christ in the middle of all this chaos. That makes perfect sense because what better place to find Christ than in chaos? Because at least there's something to stand on. So anyways, you guys, um, I'm going to start closing this down. But uh, didn't mean to ramble so, so, so much. Um, all right, last couple comments here. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Pam, you said you had a bunch of stuff that you wanted to comment on, and uh, Michael, you've been great, and uh, Jay, hilarious as always. Uh, but you guys, I want you to spread the word. I want you to um, get some people that need answers 
find some questions that have bugged you. Get, uh, um, if you're watching right now live or if you're watching, you know, the taped uh, episode later on, I want you to go ahead and submit your questions to submissions at sanctuaryinternational.com. Make sure you put them to the attention of Steve Casto or connect the dots. And I will go ahead and get some of those things put together. Um, feel free, please, to, as things strike your brain uh, that you may have wondered or whatever, uh, to, to ask questions. I mean, here we're all here to learn. I mean, I have to do all this study because I'm learning too. And that means that I'll get things wrong from time to time. So feel free to correct me if I miss a bit of logic or misquote something or whatever, I, I encourage you to, to speak up because you guys, we're in a, we're in a world that, that is not necessarily getting any better. And it's the cycle of history as it is anyway. You know, we go through tribulation, persecution, and then we have a reformation or some type of revolution and Christianity becomes acceptable again and then we get comfortable and complacent and judgmental and we add to the gospel and then people go away from God and then Christianity looks stupid and then we go right back into the cycle again. Here we are at the end of a 200 year cycle, you guys. We had Christian freedoms when this country was very first started with the best of intentions of having a place of freedom where we could worship without anybody looking over our shoulder. And now that's changing. And a lot of it's our fault. Because we allowed things to come in that were not truth. That were not just the simple truth of following God, walking with him humbly, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves or as ourselves. So you guys... The, the gospel is simple. It's a gospel of love. You know, we, we you know, I was reading in first John four, seven and eight today. Uh, Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and love is born of God and all those. Uh, shoot. I just went out of my brain. But anyway, you get the point. First John four, seven, and eight. If you want to look it up, um, God is love. And we being in the image of God, we need to reflect that love. That is one of the things that make us a light on a hill. Is because it's pure. It's not self-motivated. It is not looking to attain notoriety or power or prestige or anything along those lines. All it's looking for is to serve and to help and to love. And that's our motivating factor. <clears throat> if we love the way that God loved. And so, <clears throat> you guys, we need to continue to to lift each other up in prayer. We need to continue to to encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, it's been fun hanging out as always and reading your comments. Um, let's see. What am I going to do with all these posters? Now? Oh, okay. Huh. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Thanks Darren. It was DMT. Excellent. Uh, doesn't God have to start working on the heart of a believer before the Bible will be clear to them? Uh, Edward Carter just asked a question here and uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, you know, this is all up to God in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the Bible, the Bible will speak to sometimes people without having any proofs at all. But for those that are on the intellectual side, a lot of times they need a little bit more because they have to unlearn. You have to unlearn a lot of gobbledygook that has been put into the education system across the world about the, the Bible being just a bunch of fairy tales. And but the thing is, it is the word of God that never returns void. You can throw it out in the water and it'll always come back and it'll be richer and more meaningful than than it ever was before. But yes, I can speak a million words to you in the most profound way. But unless those words are made alive by the power of God and the interpretation of the Holy Spirit, then it will be meaningless. So, yes, it does require God's uh, God's touch, if you will, on those words and on the word of God and on the Bible itself. 
and sometimes it takes years. But we're, you know, let me go back for a second. We're all on a journey <clears throat> between here and there, between where we started, where we were born, and all of eternity. And we're going to find God along the way, and we have a lot of lessons to learn on the way and a lot of perfecting to go through. So um, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the, uh, for the word of God to sink in. And for a lot of people, it is foolishness. And even in First Corinthians, it talks about, you know, that God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And um, that that because because of its simplicity and until you're like, you know, kind of your eyes are open to the simplicity and oh, wow, that's what that means of the gospel. Then, yeah, it won't sink in. So you're absolutely right there. Um, See, my computer's frozen now. Oops, I uh, hit the nail on the head. Steve. Oh, good. Uh, some believe Christians can't have fun if they only knew. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so, speaking of fun, uh, man, I, I I can't wait to meet some of you guys. I finally got to meet Roger West the other week. We uh, a bunch of us got together over at Larry Fish's place to hang out and have campfire and you know grill uh, you know grill some food and all that fun stuff. Um, and you know what? That's like some of the best times on the in, in, on the planet is just hanging out and, and you and walking away, just enriched, having your life in, made more full. And, and 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 when you're trying to kind of wrap this whole without God, there is no meaning thing up. And when you're trying to do this as an atheist, yes, you can go away feeling like you just accomplished something, did something of meaning, and all that kind of stuff. There's a difference between having a temporal temporal sense of meaning and an eternal, this is going to last forever kind of a meaning. That's the difference that, the, that, that, that without God, your life doesn't have a deep eternal sense of meaning. And that's the most fulfilling because it feeds the eternal part of ourselves. The flesh is going to pass away and everything that is done to give meaning to the body that's only alive for, you know, if you're lucky, 70, 80, 90 years, that's all going to pass away. And it is going to be pointless. But when you have the capacity to have meaning for all of eternity and know that the things that you do and say will have impact throughout, like when you get a chance to speak to somebody that changes their life and you get to see them for all of eternity, that's amazing. But you know what? It's foolish to think that God is bigger than the universe. God is bigger than time. God is more powerful than the strongest storm, than the strongest solar storm, than the supposed Big Bang. God is more powerful than all that. And that's impossible to conceive because our brains aren't that big. So that's why it's foolishness to a lot of people. But uh, anyways, well, guys, I just want to um, wrap this up finally tonight. Um, thank you very much for hanging out with me once again. And uh, yeah, we're still kind of getting things perfected. But let's just pray real quick. Uh, Lord God, I just ask that you would just watch over everyone today and uh, this evening and continue to <clears throat> enrich their minds and hearts with your love and mercy. Give them wisdom and uh, all that. So, Lord Jesus, watch over us. Help us to be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Amen. So don't forget to write, submit your questions, submissions at sanctuaryinternational.com. I encourage you to write them in, and I'll get them answered in upcoming episodes. Thank you very much. Appreciate your tuning in. Have a great evening. Love you lots. Bye for now.